right now, technically, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland, uh, but I'm a research professor, so I teach very little. I'm mainly writing and also helping direct a large project, which we call the Democracy Collaborative. So partly research, partly we're developing real projects in the world that have to do with changing uh, the ownership of wealth towards a more democratic form, practical things uh, that are going on. So those are the two th balls I bounce. Uh, I, before that, I've, uh, I'm pretty well known as a historian of the bombing of Hiroshima, which is one of the areas of diplomatic history. I ran House and Senate staffs at various points in my life. I uh, was a policy planning in the State Department, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I have a PhD from the University of Cambridge. I was a fellow of King's College, a fellow of the Institute of Politics at Harvard, et cetera. Oh, the, the, um, the numbers have been dramatic in the last 30 years. Uh, basically, wages for the bottom 80% have flatlined. The top 1% has increased its share of income. The top 1% has more income than the bottom 120 million people taken together. But it has taken its income from 1%, from 10% roughly, to 23.5%. That means the bottom 99% and mostly people well below, have lost all that income. And it's gone to the top 1%. It's a staggering change historically in concentration of income. Wealth, and particularly ownership of productive wealth, stocks and bonds and businesses, the individually held productive wealth of the United States, 1% owns just under half of the individual capital, individually held capital in the United States. If you add in pension funds, et cetera, it goes down just a little bit into the mid-40s. But most of the capital in capitalism is owned by 1%. It's staggering numbers. They're almost medieval, and I don't mean that rhetorically. I mean technically the ownership of the wealth of the society looks like a medieval society. Uh, and most people just aren't aware of these concentrations. Well, first, the inequity in it means that a lot of people are living in terrible conditions of poverty, lack of good health care, lack of good nutrition, when people at the top are buying yachts and flying private airplanes. It, there's an immoral, immoral aspect to this which just can't be denied. Now, there's a political aspect, and we're seeing it now in this election, uh, this past election, uh, where the money buys power, advertising and politics. So those are the two most obvious uh, and self-evident directions that one would look at. Uh, I did a book on the, the technological basis of wealth distribution. Most of the wealth we have comes from a, not from land and labor and hard work and capital. It comes because technology has changed. So, for instance, someone who's working with a plow in 1776 and behind a donkey, a wooden plow or an iron plow. Now, the modern equipment that you produce agricultural pr products, huge tractors, modern technology, genetic engineering, for better or worse, uh, the changes have been technological. And most of that, think of Bill Gates, think of the computer, think of the internet, all of that technological capacity is a collective inheritance for all of humankind. And that's, we've studies show that 95, 90, 90 to 95% of wealth comes from that and people working with that. That's a common inheritance and it ought to be shared in some way more equitably amongst all of us, I think, and all the people, particularly given the, the terrible conditions that are at the bottom of the, of the heap. Well, there have been a number of studies that show health, for instance, is related not simply to uh, disease, but to income distribution, that those the further down you go, the it lower the health standards are, not only because of care, but because of the anxiety and stress and inadequate nutrition. So something self-evident like that becomes obvious. Uh, loss, loss of um, time to be educated. People become less well-educated. They, they function politically in extreme ways. Uh, violence occurs. Uh, the possibilities of explosions are, uh, are obvious. But even more, the, the notion that you could have a democratic society requires that people have the capacities that are roughly not equally shared, but in, within the same range. And a society that has such un unbelievable differences in income, education, nutrition, security, fear, cannot be a democratic society in any meaningful sense.
in some strange sense, the notion of a greater and more egalitarian society is inherent in the Christian and Judeo-Christian traditions. Uh, I think that Acts 2 tells people to give up their wealth and join together in a common community. Uh, I worked with the steel workers in Youngstown and, and was supported by a, where one of the big steel companies went down in the late 70s. And there was a religious coalition led by the bishop there, the Catholic bishop and an Episcopal bishop and all of the religious leaders. And the notion was that the community and workers as a whole ought to benefit from this particular company and set it back up and get it going again. But it went right back to, to themes that you could find in the early Bible. In some sense, uh, I've seen a study recently that suggests that Karl Marx was only really translating those com communal visions and those equitable visions uh, into Marxist language. Uh, I think that overdoes it a little bit, but you find themes of equality and equity in, in all the great religions. So you start there. Uh, you find the diggers are some of the early British and English uh, fights in the in the 16th and 17th century over who should own the land and the only ownership of the commons was a theme that came up there uh, and importantly the notion that there ought to be some sort of communal form uh, the commons is language that was used now increasingly to talk about this uh, who should benefit from the wealth of the earth uh, God's creation as they as they put it in those terms the secular versions of this are you find them particularly in the 19th century uh, Socialism as a, as a term did not start with Marxism. It's well, it's well earlier than that. And the notion of socialism as a state-controlled, centralized, Stalinist bureaucracy was one tangential idea about these ideas that, as I say, essentially come out of the notion of the commons and community and, and in some sense, religious. Many other ways of formulating that, that general idea were common. Uh, the notion of community as cooperatives was one, another way to do it, in highly decentralized form. And there, the, you find many, many, many different people writing in the 19th century about this. Anarchist forms of it. Anarchism is often used as a dirty word, but it really meant against the state. You'd find people in the Tea Party who in some sense are anarchists because they think excessive state power uh, is something that ought to be opposed. I think modern democratic socialists uh, are very strongly worried about the state because they've seen what can happen in socialism without a radically decentralized base. So you don't find many modern socialists talking about the way uh, they're caricatured as the government controlling everything. Uh, modern socialists, by and large, are talking about a very different vision, which is starts at the bottom and works its way up, uh, and tries to use state power uh, to manage things in a way that's more equitable. But beginning at the bottom, from the bottom up, is, is really one of the themes you see coming up in what, what some people are calling 21st century socialism. But Owen was one of the original. Proudhon, Owen, and Saint-Simon were the, the three major characters in 19th century uh, development of these ideas. And they attempting also intentional communities, the setting up of collective communities in the United States, which is a really interesting thing to look at as, in terms of the theme of cooperatively owned communities but also the notion of intentional communities without the development of a democratic politics, uh, in my view, was always a mistake. So it did not have a political theory of what it was doing, and indeed they collapsed. Um, all, virtually all the major uh, attempts at, at uh, intentional cooperative communities failed. The most recent one that failed, uh, was the, or failed or is in great trouble, is the Israeli kibbutz. The Israeli kibbutz, which really means just a cooperative community, and there have been, you know, a large number of them were highly successful, and many still are successful, but they've really fallen down as, as a major share of Israeli society, though they were very important at one point. Socialism has gone through many iterations as to what was meant by it. I mean, the most important period of socialism in America was between the late 1890s and up till World War I. And the rise of, of Eugene Debs was the most important figure. And it was based on a, a very militant form of demands for essentially socialists. I think they got 12% of the vote at the highest point. Uh, the vision came out of an angry working class that was developed in the industrializing period of American society. It was brutally suppressed. Uh, Debs was put in prison. Uh, after the, the Red Scare, after the war, wiped out a number of other radicals. So the movement was crushed and in some cases violently crushed. Um, the, the attacks were vicious. Uh, 
it, it has not risen in any significant scale since then. There have been attempts, there was an attempt by Norman Thomas, there's always been a small socialist gathering using that language. But in fact, the, the word socialism has not been uh, significant in the modern era, except for small numbers of people uh, in, in, in uh, different diverse radical groups. So uh, socialist ideas, to a certain degree, are much more, prim are much more prominent. Um, and then there's a terminology question here, which I tend to, th I think, often gets confused. And, and it's confusing, particularly the way the right wing is using it, but also the way the left uses it. Uh, socialism classically meant the ownership of the ma major forms of capital in a public or communal way, so that the profits and wealth of that capital and its direction could be used in a common and democratic way. Uh, Notice that's different from American welfare state or European welfare states in which the idea is that the corporations own the capital and politics is used to attempt to allocate resources for public purposes while the power structure doesn't change. So for instance, social security is often called socialist. It, is, it would not be called socialist by a traditional socialist. It is a social program attached to corporate capitalism, or in the European context, that's called social democracy. So the, the attempt of many American liberals, for instance, and I come out of the liberal tradition, I used to work in the Congress for liberal congressmen and senators, uh, many people come out of the liberal tradition. That tradition attempted and still attempts to manage regulating the corporation and allocating resources through taxing and spending uh, without touching the power structure. Uh, the socialist idea was you can't do that. that that's, you're going to lose that battle unless you find ways to translate the ownership to large numbers of people in a way that's democratically controlled. Where much of socialism has had a difficulty, and I think needs to be, I think the conservatives were right on this and the, the left hasn't acknowledged it, excessive centralization of power comes with if you gave the state all of the capital. And that, they were right about that. It, it's a dangerous form. That's why some of the more interesting things that are happening in these themes, whatever they're called, have to do with the decentralized ownership of wealth at the community level, at the workplace level, at the cooperative level. That set of ideas, a participatory vision, is a very different notion. There then may be very important ways that some parts of the ownership of large-scale capital responding to a community-based buildup of democratic forms and in a sense controlled by the processes that are democratic that come out of the ground, that form might have the chance of controlling, for instance, the banking structure. The American banking structure is controlled by very small numbers of people who have very different interests at heart than, than most of the mass of the American people. We've learned that, and we will learn it again, and probably again, most experts studying, predicting crises every five to seven years and deepening crises. At some point, who owns and controls that structure? Is it responsive to the people? or is it responsive to the banks and the banking hedge fund managers? That's the kind of question. Which ones need to be under democratic control, not whether the whole system ought to be? And I think what's really interesting about the modern era is the vision of cooperatives, worker-owned companies, land trusts, neighborhood development forms, social enterprise, and the vast expansion of these kinds of efforts are beginning, let me say it carefully, beginning to lay groundwork for a different form of set of ideas that is decentralized, that humanistic, and could become the basis over time of a new politics that would have a very different vision than the traditional state kind of direct socialist vision that I think has had its own troubles that we need to acknowledge. The language of this is not yet developed. I mean, in Latin America, you'll find the language of 21st century socialism. But Latin America is a different case. Um, the language I used, and whether it's socialist or de democratic cooperative vision, I've used the language of a pluralist commonwealth. Now, the reason there are plural forms of common wealth, the most obvious being a co-op or a public utility. There are 2,000 public utilities in the United States. They're operating every day. Now, some people may say, hey, that's socialism. And of course it is, publicly owned utilities. But on the other hand, it's very decentralized. It's very conventional. It's very practical. That's a different form of common ownership than a co-op or a worker-owned company.
or the Tennessee Valley Authority or Social Security. These different pieces are very, very different and they form a plurality of forms of changing ownership away from concentrated corporate ownership, but in a way that democratizes the processes. I think that direction is important, and whether the language of pluralist commonwealth is the right language or some other language, uh, that's to be determined, but, but the forms are what I think is important. The notion of so state socialism which is the central notion that has been developed by most and is meant by most people when they talk about socialism, has not been richly developed in a radically decentralized form. So that if you believe in democracy from the bottom up, if you believe in liberty being threatened by too powerful a state, then you need to ask what is the nature of the system? What do you really want? If you don't like capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what do you want? And if you don't know what you want, why should we listen to you? So for me, it's, it's first and foremost a question of, of the integrity of the ideas. Uh, that's number one. I, af, after that, yes, of course, the notion of socialism has been so bastardized uh, that it's a term that doesn't help much anymore, uh, certainly in the United States. Uh, I think that's also true. It's a politically un, un, unuseful term. But in a different way, and this is point three, it's very odd because almost anything any Democrat proposes now is called socialism. So it has lost its meaning in, in any particular way that if, uh, if you are for Social Security or Medicare, you must be a raving socialist. So in a way, the term may become de defanged because of its, uh, the stupidity in, in the ways in which people have been using it and the arbitrary use of it. It may lose its, uh, its uh, former connotations because of the, of the rhetorical excess. But my, I start with the notion need, really needs to be developed in a way that is, is participatory and from the bottom up. And that is different from the traditional models in most of them. Though the spirit of democratic socialism has always been democratic and participatory, the actual model didn't really have a very strong political structural theory of how to make democracy work. And I've been very concerned with how do you consider, how do you develop from the ground up, not just in the workplace, and this is really critical, but in the community as a whole, community by community, democratic processes that are, not, that are not thwarted by high concentrations of income and power, but are also democratized so that the society, if you take Tocqueville or many other theorists, so that the society that is built has a culture of democracy and democratic ownership and democratic participation from the bottom up as the precondition of a democratic society. So I've been very concerned with the notion of the community as a whole and how that becomes democratized. That's where I begin my thinking about wealth and ownership, and then build up to what are, the Catholics have a, a term about, a term of art in Catholic social theology, which has to do with the, the, what ought to be decentralized, ought to be decentralized from the bottom as much as possible. And only that which needs to go to a higher level ought to go to a higher level, and only that which needs to go to a further level should be centralized. And I think that's the way to think about it. And that's not common in most socialist thought, though it is compatible with the democratic socialist vision. Certainly there is a culture of individualism and historians and cultural historians have traced that back and there are theories about why the American culture of individualism has grown up and why not only the culture but ideas about individualism which are even more intense than the actual culture. So if you go down to, I'm from Racine, Wisconsin, a Midwestern industrial town. If you go down to Racine, Wisconsin, you'll pe find people my friends in high school, my old buddies, will be very conservative in some sense, but they will be extremely cooperative in their actual practices in other sense. I'm thinking of a particular couple friends who will be helping the, t the town, they'll be volunteering their efforts, they'll be cooperating with the whole community in a very genuinely American cooperative way. At the same time, uh, they will be spouting extremely right-wing ideas about individualism and the state shouldn't get in my way. So there's a contradiction, but it isn't entirely that Americans are as individualist as many people think. Uh, as I say, there are, you know, there are, there are 11,000, last count, worker-owned companies in the United States. There are more people involved in worker-owned companies in the United States of America than are members of unions in the private sector. There are 120 million people involved in co-ops. So something is contradictory between the actual day-to-day -day experience at the level of ordinary 
the American experience, and the rhetoric that people will expound. They, they themselves will say individualism, keep the state off my hands, etc. At the same time, they're doing something else. To me, the rhetoric has got to change at some point, but I'm much more interested in how we develop these nascent ideas that are working their way out in practical terms, very, very practical building from the bottom up is I think the precondition and a very important precondition and indeed growing precondition of changing the way people think about cooperation, about community, about ideas of what ought to be done. And I, I have some hope about that process in part because of the pain levels. People are being forced to do things at the local level, to think about things in a new way, to innovate in a new way. And in a paradoxical way, one of the, uh, one of the positives of this period of our, our history is that because some of the old answers aren't working politically as well as economically, people are struggling to find new ways forward. And I think there's, there's hope in that process along with the enormous pain. I worked in the Senate running a staff of, uh, for Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, uh, the Wisconsin senator who was a great environmentalist. And uh, we lived at the time of a particular moment when there were great liberal progress. It happened to be the moment in the mid-60s. Goldwater had taken down a large number of members of the House. There were 66 senators who were Democrats. Lyndon Johnson jammed through the Great Society. And we thought that was what was going to happen for, uh, forever. But in fact, it was a temporary moment. And very shortly thereafter, the balance was restored to block things. So uh, when I come out of that tradition, uh, and one of, the, one of the things that really made me think about all of this was the capacity of that system to solve problems was actually narrowing as time went on. The period from the Great Depression through the modern Great Society, the New Deal and the Great Society, were really an aberrant moment in American history and American liberalism. We're in a different period now, I think, where that, we're not, the pendulum isn't going to swing we may develop a new pendulum out of the groundwork in a very different way, but the old notion the pendulum will swing that we used to believe in those days, I think was wrong. It was the tail end of a movement that came about because of the great crisis of the Depression, World War II, and the boom. Uh, and that was a special moment in history. We live in a different era um, that I think people have yet to come to terms with. What ultimately drove me to worry about these things, and I think ought to drive other people, is expansionist systems become imperial systems. They have to, in the history of American expansion into the global market, was a, de was a vision of an informal empire, not a colonial empire, but one that had American interests at heart and often led to interventions that were violent. Uh, and I think that source, undercutting that source by a more democratic and more stable system is ultimately critical. I think it's critical not only for us, but for critical for many, many parts of the developing world where our mistakes are visited on them so often. Uh, so I would drive it back deeply to the sources of expansionism in this particular corporate capitalist system and undermining those by building a more stable and healthy system. Uh, the positive direction, I think in both cases, is the answer, uh, a reconstruction of that direction, uh, even as we try to limit the damage. Uh, one of the hardest problems is we live in a society that is continental in scale. You could drop Germany into Washington and Oregon combined. Those tiny little European countries, they are tiny compared with this continental system. Uh, it's very hard to have a society now over 300 million people in a gigantic continent have a system of participatory democracy. It doesn't, ring, doesn't make sense. We're going to be 500 million by mid-century. The Census Bureau projects its high number for the end of the century as 1.1 billion. Even if we don't get to those numbers, any society that wants to be democratic will have to decentralize. You cannot run it all from Washington. And you cannot run it all with a, a dying constitutional structure that is obviously unable to make major decisions. At some point, that means decentralization decision-making decentralized, both because of the size and because of the constitutional structure that prevents action. Most states are too small to make really serious decisions. The country's too large 
The obvious intermediate scale to which this all points logically is the region, New England. California is a region. The notion that the country ultimately will in some way decentralize to regional structures I think is self-evident. It's a very difficult one, but maybe the attack on what's happening in Washington now and the deadlock and the feeling that something is really wrong there will lead people to say either we do it in a new way and build up to a, a new constitutional crisis over the next 30 years that I think ultimately leads towards some form of decentralization compatible with democracy, compatible with these very large changes of numbers. So we'll see, but I think that's in the cards over the long haul if we build towards it. Uh, individual co-ops can easily become small, um, self-aggrandizing forms for a small group of workers. Uh, famous stories about the plywood co-ops in your part of the country, in Oregon, uh, which were actually co-ops and have gone out of business for reasons that had very little to do with them, had to do with wood supply. But they began to hire other people, and it was a small group of men who made more money and then hired people at lower wages and changed the whole nature of the culture. Um, co-ops and worker-owned companies have a spirit of ownership, but often in the marketplace they're forced to pollute if they have to because other competitors are polluting. Uh, they become quite narrow in their interests. They may or may not support the community. So while I'm generally supportive of co-ops, I think they have to be looked at very carefully. We're doing work in Cleveland uh, with a series of worker-owned cooperatives that we're helping generate, but they are also anchored and this is a particularly interesting structure. They're integrated in a community anchor, which is a nonprofit corporation, so that they are forced in a way to help build the community rather than only self-aggrandizement for the small group of people who are in the co-ops. That's a different structure. It's an integrated community-based vision, including worker ownership. So it's a very interesting form that, that builds the community at the same time it builds worker ownership. And I'd say that's an important way to think about uh, the direction uh, beyond simply saluting co-ops, uh, which, as I say, I think they're very important because they change people's idea about what can be done, but they're not the last word. Um, another piece of this that's important, and this has to do with the environmental issues. Uh, the Cleveland work we've done, for instance, is oriented in part, significant part, towards a market that is essentially a quasi-public market. Hospitals and universities have a lot of public money and in Cleveland we're directing some of that purchasing power, three billion dollars the hospitals buy in Cleveland and the universities, towards local firms that are worker community owned. Now that's important both to help those firms but it also gives them stability where they don't have to grow in an aggressive fashion. They may want to or not but for ecological reasons Instability drives people to do things that are ecologically disastrous. And trying to stabilize the market in this way is a model, a way of thinking about the relationship between decentralized community slash worker cooperatives and stability provided by a quasi-public market. Healthcare being the most obvious one that can help stabilize the community as a whole, undercut the drive to grow and pollute, but also help worker-owned companies. So that's a model that's more complex but has a, a serious set of ideas about the environment that most socialism in the past really didn't take up. And it's, it's important to do, particularly if you think about growth. Most private businesses in a marketplace or capitalist marketplace must try to grow out of fear, even more than greed. Because if you don't grow, somebody might take your market and you might die. At that place is the heart of the ecological crisis polluting, growing, climate change, out of fear. So the only answer is some stability of that market. And that means a new design, uh, like the design in which some form of public, public st stability is given by the market, and the market is uh, a public market, quasi-public market, but highly decentralized towards the community and worker and owned level. I've been doing a lot of work with the environmental movement lately. Uh, and people who are beginning to see that the environmental movement has to deal with economics rather than just regulation, mm -hmm. uh, the traditional move. But most environmentalists, even the ones, the leading figures who are beginning to say it's time for a new economy, a new debate, 
uh, understand that growth, unrestricted growth, is the source of the major problem. They still would like to try in the traditional fashion to regulate that growth. And most of our experience is that trying to regulate a dynamic form of growth gets beaten down because the power of those people who are being regulated is greater than your power to regulate. The only answer is to create more stability to the market so they don't have to grow and still can succeed. And as I said, growth is driven as much as by fear. You will lose your market, someone will take it over if you don't grow, as it is by greed. And greed there's plenty of greed. And these forms that are beginning to develop, which provide some form, not entire, but some form of stability, some form of stability that p purchases by public hospitals and public universities in the local area, some form of stability is a way to undercut the growth dynamic. Let me give you another broader one. Uh, at some point, the United States is going to go into mass transit and bullet train that we're putting money into it now. Nobody in the United States makes bullet trains. So we're going to buy them from foreigners. Right now, th that's a public market. It's going to be paid for by the taxpayers. It could be used and directed so that worker community-owned firms were built in America to stabilize places like Detroit and also undercut the growth dynamic by giving some stability to those firms building for the public rails and mass transit and that sort of de design. So that's the way to think about getting beyond the growth dynamic, some form of public market. Because we have a, the government is 30 percent, 32 percent. It's not going to change much down even under assault right now. Ultimately probably go up more with Medicare, even given the balance of politics. Using that existing taxpayer money to help undercut these forces rather than trying only to regulate them is a way to stabilize communities and to undercut the dynamic that is driving growth. Uh, most environmentalists understand the problem of growth, but they haven't been willing to struggle with the real power dynamics in the market that drive companies, even in the best companies, to have to grow. Uh, and I think it's time that the environmental movement is going to have to step up to this, this question. Uh, I'm a historian, and uh, any historian who thinks about these things, thinks in, in 30 year bites minimally. Uh, you know, major revolutions are as common as grass in world history. They are almost always unpredictable. They almost always come out of conditions that have looked impossible to the people before something happens. Latin America over the last 30 years has had an enormous uprising against much greater odds of popular governments and changes, more progressive changes. If you'd asked 30 years ago in Latin America what was going to happen, you would have found people being shot on the street by dictatorial governments virtually across the whole continent almost. So I see things from a historical perspective. Um, my heroes, for instance, and here's another way to think about it. My heroes are the civil rights workers in Mississippi in the 1930s, not the 60s. And I have great respect for people in the 60s. But people who understood in the 30s that the fight was a long fight and laid the groundwork for what became ultimately an explosive change. So that, I think about things that way and I think, I, I think that's the only way to understand. I sometimes tell people or students or lecture, you want to get into this game, the price is decades of your life. Don't play around with it unless you're serious. So you want to do this, this is changing the largest corporate capitalist system in the world. Um, is a very, very challenging task but also not impossible. Another way to think about it, I'm from Wisconsin. I, went, I was at the University of Wisconsin in the days of Joe McCarthy. In Wisconsin, they shot anything that moved politically. Joe McCarthy was everywhere. And if you'd asked anybody there, um, is any change possible? The answer was, of course not. And of course, what happened next was the 60s. So I'm very cautious about saying, because things are dark now, uh, nothing can change. Finally, I'm, you know, the other side of the other hat I wear as a political economist, I'm very interested and we study what's going on on the ground and there is an enormous amount that the, the press, partly because it has, is not interested, partly because it's underfunded, partly because it's under corporate control, the press doesn't cover what's going on on the ground level and there is a great deal of new construction of new institutions, new forms, new cooperatives, new worker-owned companies, 
under, uh, that's happening all over the country, and not simply in the Northeast, but all over the country. So I see the basis slowly, potentially, I'm not a determinist, but potentially things have a positive swing, particularly in times that are so difficult, people have to do new things. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we do very interesting things in this country. Who knows, but the only question is you have to try it or you can't get there. Well, politics is, is an expression both of attitudes and agitation and, and new themes and new ideas. But it also, critically, is an expression of institutional power. So, for instance, the modern liberalism at its height depended both upon ideas and theories of value and liberty and equality, but it also had a strong labor movement as an institution to bolster it against corporate power. The labor movement is slowly decaying into small percentages of the population, from 33% to 7% in the private sector, 12%. Either we build new institutions, including cooperatives, worker-owned companies, land trusts, social enterprises, all the kinds of institutions that are developing in thousands around the country, partly because of their value in and of themselves but also as the precondition institutionally of a different power base that begins to push back, displace, take different forms away from large corporations, and makes alliances also with small businessmen and small bankers who themselves are being squeezed by these larger forms. That process at the community level, building from the bottom up, I think is a way to build an institutional component critically to the next politics. So I see the ideas as very important in the, of their own, that the ownership of wealth in the small worker-owned company or co-op is a very different way of owning wealth than the top 1% owning almost half of the privately held investment capital. That theme and democracy of the workplace, those themes are very important. That those companies are anchored in community. They don't get up and run the way the big corporations do because the people live there. That's important. But the notion also that we're building institutional power to displace, to push back, to create a power, base, a power base also for a different politics, I think needs to be taken seriously. And most progressive haven't thought about it in that particular way. Um, ideas are important. Getting really clear about ways to move forward step by step and what you really want and what you don't want. At certain points in history, ideas matter. Uh, I often say, as a historian and a political economist, at most periods of history, momentum matters. Ideas don't matter. But when there is deepening crisis, getting real clarity about what counts and what really matters becomes really critical, and this is one of those times. Uh, I've gone through the 60s and the great movements of the 60s. It's very easy to join a movement when a movement's moving. The really interesting work, the people I admire most, are those who see their own role as building now for the movement that will come. And I'm, I'm uh, as a historian uh, and as a political economist, I think the conditions that are becoming so difficult in this country and are crying out for solution are going to bring about openings for something that is actually practical, American, and very real. So I see the current times paradoxically as opening new space for people who understand what's happening. The, the reality is that tr the traditional solutions are not working and will not work. The reality is even traditional liberal solutions are politically not going to work. A new way forward is necessary. And people who are serious about it, not rhetorical, but practical, and have clear ideas of what needs to be built and how to build concretely, as thousands of people are doing around the country just below the horizon of what the press take seriously, those people I think are laying groundwork for something extremely important potentially. Acting now has one other advantage. You may or may not be laying groundwork for a transformation that becomes something of great moment and power with a social movement, but all of it is positive. All of it lays groundwork and does useful things in community by community. So I, I see almost no loss and a great deal of gain to move forward positively uh, rather than to say, well, it doesn't matter what I do or things can't be done. Uh, we all have a you know, kind of vested interest in pessimism. Uh, if you like your pessimism, you don't have to do anything because nothing's going to matter. So uh, take another look at your pessimism and whether or not it's simply an excuse for not acting 
rather than a genuine understanding of the historical possibilities and the difficulties that all prehistories of great movements always involve.